All right, what's up, beautiful people? Welcome back to The Dinner Truth. Um, you know, we're back with another episode. Um, so today, we got a, a man who, you know, I personally believe to be a, a bedrock for the Australian music scene, someone who's, who's done the work, someone who's, you know, been um, in different parts of the business and someone who I think right now is really putting a lot of game um, in the Australian music scene and making it relevant, really putting people out there and really reaching out to the youth. Um, you know, I really wanted to get this person in because um, I just really wanted people to get this information and really to champion people who, who are doing the great work. So today, uh, we got Hal. So, um, Hal, how are you doing? Dino, thank you very much. A wonderful intro, and <laughs> I appreciate that. I kind of feel like it's... A, um, like a eulogy or something, but I'm still yeah, here. Hey, I'm still alive. Look, my vibe this year was I gotta make sure I appreciate people now. Yeah. Now nah, we're not appreciating no, them tomorrow. Appreciate them now. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And I especially totally agree. because I've I've been seeing the work that you've been doing, um, not only on Triple J and the radio, um, but just a, a, a lot to do with a lot of the other artists. You know, um, I think one of the hardest things. Um, in, become, in being an artist and getting out and doing something of your own is, you know, sometimes you just need that help. Sometimes mm -hmm. you need that guidance. Sometimes you need to tell someone, you, you just need that sort of assistance in just getting you in the right direction. And totally. I feel like you're someone who, you just give that game out for free. Yeah. And, you know, and I feel like with the vibe that, you know, the Australian, Australian music scene is on right now, I feel like you're definitely someone who's definitely needed mm -hmm. um, to play that position. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and it is true. You know, I... You know, I started off as, a, as an artist and I put out my first music in 93. Damn. And at that time... I wasn't even born. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, I was only two then. Nah. <laughs> um, and, you know, at that time, I mean, even hip-hop from America wasn't even popping like that. You know, record store, there were only certain places. This was way before the net was popping. Yeah. And, and only certain places where you could pick up import records from the UK or from the US. So even knowing that, Hip hop in Australia was just like it was nothing. I mean, I had pi um, pioneers like I would look up to, but it was just such a small community, and so a lot of us had to figure out this stuff on our own. Yeah, a lot of trials and tribulations, which was exciting at the same at the same time. And and at that time, the the scene was very genuine, and very um, passionate. Um, but again, we had to figure out things ourselves in an industry that didn't take us seriously so once i got into a position where i had learned a lot and and gained a lot of experience i wanted to be the person that i needed when i was coming up yeah, you yeah. Know, my man ricky said you know be the mentor that you wish you had yeah and that's that's what i feel like you know i, I, n I never want to give any unsolicited um, feedback or advice I always mm -hmm. put myself like Yo, I like what you're doing I'm here If, if you need advice, feedback Just hit me up you yeah. know? And it's important for someone Who's <coughs> been in the game for a long time To be able to reach out to the youth Because they're the ones that are going to carry on the torch Yeah, and even Rick, Rick as well Rick's, Rick's my man And Rick's yeah. someone who has helped me so much with this podcast Has helped me with just sort of seeing things In a different sort of light and mm. perspective Rather than just seeing seeing it as just drop something and drop it. Actually have a vision, actually have a plan to drop exactly. something. Have like a long-term plan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that being said, you know, you were talking a little bit about how, you know, you grew up um, and, you know, where you were from, you didn't necessarily have the access to gain the music. Yeah. So, so t tell us a little bit about, about where <laughs> you grew up, your background, you know, where you're from. Yeah, man. I, I was born in Canberra. <coughs> grew up in Queen Bean, which is just outside of Canberra. It's part yeah. of New South Wales, but... Um, you know, people, it's pretty much like a suburb of Canberra. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, you know, the net wasn't popping like that. So for us to get on, we had to travel to Sydney or go to Melbourne. Jeez. Go to a show, get us face the scene. And, but back then, we, we had hubs, like record stores. Yeah, yeah. That we would go to. And I, I loved those days because you would see people face to face and then... You'd walk in one day and, oh, I think that's so-and-so. Yeah, yeah. You go up and say, hey, are you uh, blah, blah, blah? And then, yeah. And like, oh, I do music. Oh, me too. And then it'd be that human interaction that I feel we're missing a lot these days. Yeah. But that's the way of the world. You know, you just roll with how it is. Um, and so, yeah, we had to... Um, I often tell people a story where I would work, like work save money, 
catch a bus, like the first bus from Canberra, which is like 6.30, come to Sydney, shop all day, records, clothes, and then catch the bus, the last bus, which was like eight or something, back to Canberra. And that's how I'd get music and clothes. And that's Are you sit- oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that's but that's how I would that's how I appreciated things. Yeah, yeah. Because I, you went to great lengths, whereas now music is you know is so disposable. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's why the position I am in now, I, I don't take for granted, and I, and I know I need to share this information because when I was coming up, you know, people didn't want to share that information, especially with hip hop kids. Yeah. You know, like, oh, this is a fad. These kids are trying to be American. This is not Australian. You're not Australian, you know. Um, so it, it, in some parts, it was a struggle, but it was it was a beautiful struggle. Yeah. You know now, I mean? you, you appreciate the grind, man. Like, I grew up in Armadale. Yeah. So oh, I, all right. Yeah, I grew up in Armadale. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I You're know what country it, boy. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, so I know what it feels like, you know, to grow out in those yeah. towns where it's like, it's literally, I feel like some country towns are at least five months behind yeah like they're, they're at least because it's so hard to get and i and i'm saying for someone who grew up with the, with the internet now yeah yeah, yeah so know? i'm saying that from someone with the internet, so i can imagine what it was right. like you know you, we, it was only one person in our crew that had a mobile phone and even then it was like those brick ones and so, then, so how did you guys link up we're home phones yeah bro i'm 43 yeah you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah home phones, home phones. it'll be like Oh, hi, Mrs. Tonks. Is Brendan home? Oh, he's not home. Maybe try at six. Okay, cool. I'll call back at six. And that was it. Shit, man. Shout out iPhone. Shout right. out Samsung. Right. Shout out. I talked to my niece and she was like, so how, how did you contact each other? Like, oh, and like I told you. That yeah. Story, and like, it just couldn't grasp. I, I honestly couldn't grasp. But it. you know, you could dunk people so easy back then. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you know, you, you know, your mom answered. Like, I was going to oh, say that. Here. That would have been a good one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not here. Oh, no. How's not here? Bang, won't see him until another 24 hours. Damn. Whereas now, you just so con- if it's not your phone, it's your iPhone, it's IG, it's social media. Mm. But it's so easy to get consumed by that shit, you know, because <laughs> it especially is. It's, and, a very, and it's a catch 22, man. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think it's a double edged sword where yeah. I think the internet, like I said, for music uh, musicians, even artists in general, like, mm. you know, you have a platform where you could reach a million people within a day. Yeah. You know, and people can, I think most importantly, what people can do now is if you, if you like an artist, you can see what they do day, day by day. Yeah, yeah. You can look at their story, all right, 9, 10, 11, yeah. this is where you're at. So it becomes more of a personal thing. Yeah. Like I feel like now uh, people are able to walk with the artists yeah. rather than people are having artists having, being on like a, like a pedestal where yeah. you, it's so unreachable. Yeah. And, and, and there is good, good and bad because like you, like you said, it opens up a, a <coughs> part of their lives where we, we didn't have access. But that makes them and you can see that they're actual human beings as yeah, opposed yeah, to yeah. like these superstars. Now you can see them with their kids or, you know, just going shopping. But at the same time, it's it's so much access that we kind of lose any kind of mysticism about an artist. You know, when I grew yeah. up, you would hear about an artist. But sometimes you wouldn't even see what they look like. You just hear a song. It'd be like, like oh, wow, just the music. what it looks like. Yeah. And then you see a photo and you're like, wow, I didn't think he would look like that at all. Yeah. You know? and, and we used to get magazines and, Read up about LL Cool J and Big Daddy Kane. Like, oh wow! And wouldn't hear that music for like six months. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. So, 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 grew up near Canberra. Yeah, Tongan parents. They came in the sixties. Yeah. Damn, in the sixties. Yeah, they were like the f- part of the first. The f- that, that, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a long ass time ago. Yeah. I've never seen. It's it's it's, it's interesting seeing like immigrants because I feel like I come to Australia I came to Australia 20 years ago yep. and a lot of people look at me like man you've been here for ages yeah and right. I hear you've been here for since the, since the yeah, 60s yeah. so what what were some of your early influences music because like you said um, you know traveling all the way to Sydney yeah and um, I guess being I guess there weren't many too many islanders within your community right uh, there, there definitely was a community um, but I've I, I was like an outcast, not treated like an outcast. Yeah, yeah. But just what I would listen to, how I would dress, yeah, was totally different to a lot of islanders. But, and, and you know, and I think that is because my parents were a lot different than a lot of your traditional kind of parents. Yeah, my dad was was your typical father, like hard worker, but he was also very loving and and would be with us. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't yeah. be such a hierarchy kind of structure household. yeah where it's like oh that's the dad you don't talk to the dad this way this and that yeah and my mom she came here 
at 18 to put herself through nursing school. Don't so she's a very <laughs> educated person and she had us worked. And then we, when we were in high school, she put herself through uni. And so when she did that, my dad held it down. You know, he went to work, come home, wash, like cook, wash. And, you know, I would say these things. Yeah, and yeah. It wasn't like a traditional household where the father just does this and the mom just does that. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I was influenced by a lot of that and also the friends I grew up with, multicultural um, crew, and and they will be listening to different things and than my relatives. And so I'll be influenced from both sides. And a lot of the early stuff I would listen to would be like your reggae and pop, like Michael Jackson and, and, and R&B and new edition and stuff like that. But then when I first heard Grandma's Flash, the message, I was like, oh, shit, what's this? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, wow. And, and the video, if you've seen the message, um, it's shot in the Bronx and at a time when <coughs> a lot of the places were being burnt down. Yeah. And it just feel like this totally different world. Like, wow. And the way they were dressed, the way they spoke, the breakdancing, the graffiti. And it, I, at that time, I was like, I was overwhelmed. Mm, what is yeah. this culture, you know? And I was just drawn in and it, and it felt like, okay, this is my music. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then from then on, I would look, get magazines, read this, like buy records and read the liner notes like oh shouting out so and so and this oh who's that and then try and f get as much information as i could and um yeah it's just an exciting time yeah that would have been crazy i mean yeah and you know that being said you know i can definitely see your passion for like old school hip-hop old school r&b mm -hmm. and when when i was when i was um doing some research about you i was the little stalk of all my guests um that come on there you go do your research for yeah that. man look God damn it, I got to. <laughs> yeah, but um, when I was looking, listening to some of your early music that you were making with Coolism, yeah, I sort of got that vibe too. Like I was just like, it, it was a mixture of you know some of these people who are actually spinning. It was just, it, it was two of you. Um, me, I was the vocalist, and then Daniel Sun, he was the producer. DJ. Oh, producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um. It was it was a lot of old school R and B, but it was very funky. Yeah, if that makes sense. It had, no, it, it, had a, it, it had a lot of bounce. Yeah. So definitely, like listening to that sort of music, I could definitely tell where you guys sort of got that old school mm. uh, old school hip hop sort of mentality in regards to spitting mm. straight bars. But it was also very contemporary, just in regards to like it had a bounce. You yeah, know exactly. I mean? And and even compared to our contemporaries, <laughs> we were very advanced. You know, we were using synths and and because we were not only inspired by the hip hop that came before us. Yeah. But we were also inspired by dance hall, jungle, drum bass, breakbeat, and you know, like we'd dabble in drugs and stuff, and then come back to the studio and yeah. incorporate all of these things. And some of our peers will be looking at us like, "Who are these guys?" Yeah, on? Crazy. <laughs> you know? yeah. And and you and you look at the timeline of uh, the kind of, I mean, you know, I'm going to toot my own horn here, but. You look at the t the timeline of of production, and you see what we were creating was far beyond, you know, before our time, you know, before yeah. people started doing that, and it was because we were influenced by different things. Yeah, and we weren't scared to experiment. Yeah, whereas a lot of people, oh no, a lot of traditionalists, no, it's got to be at this PPM. You can only use this type of drums, these type of samples, and, and rap about this. And we're like, man, I'm gonna rap about playing rugby i'm gonna rap about my tongue and heritage and you know we're gonna do it over a beat that's 120 b bpm you know and we broke a lot of, of rules and, and and i feel that's how we set ourselves apart mm -hmm. um but as with a lot of things that are kind of before their time you don't get Appreciate to reap it. those rewards at that yeah. time it's, yeah. it's not till 10 years later people are like oh shit yeah cool isn't we're really on some yeah, 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 yeah. i'm like <laughs> Bro, I was trying to tell I you. I was trying, man. You guys are hating. <laughs> oh man. Um, do you feel like you know, like you said, you know, rapping at that time, you were rapping about rugby, and you were rapping okay, about, rapping um, about you know, um, being Tongan. Do you feel at like that time the Australian hip hop industry was ready for that? Do you feel no. like? Do you feel like the Australian hip hop industry in general were sort of ready for anything contemporary? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, not to say that I didn't accept it, but yeah. it, it just wasn't. Um, 
I fear wasn't as heralded as it should have been. Yeah. It should have been like, wow, these guys are really taking it out there. It was kind of like, oh, okay, they're doing something different, but we're, this is what we're doing. Yeah, like, yeah, your yeah. Your traditional kind of DJ <coughs> premiere type of production, which I love too. Yeah. But we were like, no, nah, let's, we're influenced by other stuff. So we're, we're doing this. So, but you know, things happen for a reason. And, you know, I, I meet young cats now that say, yeah, you know, I listened to that Coolism album and it made me want to create th- this and in particular a lot of young artists um of color yeah yeah because at that time there, there wasn't many artists of color yeah man representation i realized yeah. the significance of representation Bruh, 100%. like you know just seeing you know i was talking to rick about this as well and you know um i was telling him you know so you have an artist right you know you have a musician mm. all right and and he was telling me how like that is just one part of the team you have a bunch of people on the back you know on the yeah. back side who are whether that be the um, the touring manager, the manager, mm-hmm. um, whether they have like you know so, someone who handles all the business, there's so many different parts of it that so many different p- people don't realize they can get into. Mm-hmm. But it's just because they don't see people who look like them exactly. who are in the industry, and and they don't they, like you have to. I think you have to see, you have to see to sort of believe yeah. that you can do things. And totally. um, you know, th- and that's why you know, for example, I see people like you, I see people like Rick, and, and I'm like. These people look different. Yeah. So seeing people that look different that can do this, mm-hmm. you know, that gives me that, that that drive and that motivation to kick it off. Yeah, that's, that's I totally agree with that. And, and it is about representation because I grew up in an era where you wouldn't see that on TV. Yeah. Where now, you, not as much as it should be, but at least you do see some sort of representation from different cultures. Yeah, yeah. And and I remember even just seeing a, a footy player on TV that was of Pacific Island heritage yeah. and be like. Yo, like, I think he might, he might be Samoa and he might be talking. And I just remember how it made me feel. It like, yeah. empowers you. Yeah. So I can imagine when, you know, you see someone in in the creative industry, someone like myself or, or you and, and young generation, like, wanted to do that and can see you doing it and feel like, yeah, I can do it. Or yeah. not even think about it that kind of uh, job or career and like, oh, shit. Yeah, l- l- you know, this person's doing it. L- let me try it. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and it's about, it is about representation and, and giving hope and, and inspiration to uh, to the young kids. Mm. Well, that's true. Or uh, young adults. One of my first, no, no. One of my first recorded podcasts was with More Blessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And she was, Man, compl- she's, dope, bro. She, she's, things that she told me then, now that I'm sort of like now that I'm sort of trying to get myself in that lane, everything that she told me has literally I've seen it unravel, and what she was saying was true. But basically, what she was talking about, she was talking about how um, different minority groups have a lot of um, issues breaking into the traditional music space, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, one, because we don't have representation. Two, because uh, let's say if we don't have the representation in big market, uh, um, sort of big corporations, then we have to force sort of make our own, yeah. and a lot of that time. If you're making something on your own, I thought, realistically, you need a budget or you need money to sort of create, uh, you know, yeah. create something. I think with music, you can, you can, I guess, it's a lot easier to get away with not having a lot of money. Yeah. But things like if you want to get in theatre, that's a lot yeah. more difficult. If you want to make film, mm. that's a lot more difficult. Yeah. And now I'm starting to realise that, like, you know, I think personally, for me, my whole, my whole thing about creating the podcast was just, I just want to do it on my own. Mm. Like, I, I just want to do it on my own. Whatever, wherever, it ta- wherever it takes from here is where, where it goes. But I had, to, I had to make sure that like I had full control, mm. you know, my image and what I wanted it to be was there yep. and then sort of working at it because I made a lot of mistakes. You, know? you have to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's how you learn, bro. It's like, you know, watching some of my early ones, sometimes I just cringe. <laughs> I'm just like, damn. It's all man. part of the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, going back to what more Blessings talking about, like theater and film. Yeah, I can't imagine how hard that, that would be because with music, we, we set the rules. <clears throat> Yeah, black and brown people. Body, it's like, like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. we're the cool ones in this industry. Even though higher up, we need more people in certain positions. But you know, when we do music, it's a given. Like, oh yeah, you know, he's mad. Yeah. But then when you kind of enter the realms of film and theater, I, I can imagine like, oh, what's he what's doing there? What's she doing there? Like, it's just one of those one of those like arts such as it has so much. Um, I'm actually going to get a girl who does theater t- on tomorrow, awesome. but um, there's just a lot of like structure and like old like yeah, old mentality, yeah. shit, like you know having like I know it, it, there's probably some significance by having to go to schooling. It's like you look, you're just creating so many barriers for a lot of people yeah. who 
they can just do it, but they just have to go through like ten other steps yeah. to do what they can do. Yeah, from, from, you know, and the, you know, even though there might be some five significant steps for people like us, is ten. Yeah, literally. Yeah, you know? yeah. But um, so that being said, so you do you did everything in coolism, and you know, you guys were contemporary, and you know, you felt like you were a bit ahead of your time. How did you make the transition from being an artist and then making that transition to working for Triple J? What was uh, that's probably a long period of time. Nah, <laughs> it's probably a lot. You know, because uh, there's there's a lot that goes into that time in my life. Because um, obviously, being a musician was my priority. I never thought about radio. I mean, obviously, really? oh. yeah, I, that was never in the plan. And that just goes into when opportunities present themselves, you just got to take it. Mm -hmm. So the previous host, Maya Jupiter, she was doing it for a couple of years, and I had just moved up to Sydney. And she saw me one day and said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm about to head overseas. Are you interested in filling in? And I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, it'd be cool. You know, play some tunes that I love. Yeah, yeah, cool. And then I did it and it was, it was fun. And, and then the more she, because she was an artist herself. Yeah, yeah. So when she would tour or went overseas, I would fill in. Yeah, yeah. And then there came a time where she decided to move to LA. And she said, are you interested in the job full time? I was like, um, I definitely was, but I was thinking about how is this going to impact my career? Uh, yeah, because you, you know, like our music was being played on Triple J. Is that going to hinder that? Is there going to be some kind of conflict of interest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, it, it was dedicating a lot, a lot of time away from music too. So I had to really think about it, but I knew that was a great opportunity, and and I took it. And um, yeah, been there eleven years and. Damn. Yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, but it's been awesome because, again, you know, it was never in the vision to be in this position, but I took that opportunity. And that's what I tell a lot of, a lot of the young folk is like, you know, when the opportunities come, you take them. Yeah. Because you never know where it's going to lead you. You know, with the radio, this led me to become this mentor, and then it's led me to a position at Sony and. Who knows the next couple of years, you know, and and it's, and it's given me the opportunity to work with artists like, like One Four and and Turquoise Prince and all these other artists. So, you know, one opportunity leads to another, and and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean that's awesome. But um, I think one thing that I want to touch on was so that period of you meeting my Jupiter, and then she's asking you to you know mm. to fill in the role. I guess how did you know? I guess. You were talking a lot about taking opportunities, but I'm a firm believer that, that, that there's no such thing as luck or opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you well, have to... Cr you, you create your opportunities. <coughs> yeah, th that's what I mean. Like, you have to somehow find a way to leverage yourself. No, 100%. So, so I, when that I, opportunity I, comes, you're ready to go. I definitely you know? believe that now. Because I at that time, I used to say, oh, man, it's lucky that I was there. Yeah. But my wife would be like, that's not luck. You worked hard yeah. to get to a position. You moved to to Sydney and that opportunity presents itself because you created it. And I used to think, no, that can't be. You know, it, it's luck. But then I, I would think about it and, and, and it's true. Yeah. You know, uh, um, I wrote a status about it sometime about how people say, oh man, you're such, you're, um, um, oh, you're so lucky to be in this position. I'm like, you know, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But it, luck has nothing to do with it, man. You right. know, like, Please don't discredit the twenty years it took to get to this yeah, exactly. position. Exactly. You know, so you, you you like you were saying, you create these opportunities. You put yourselves into certain positions where uh people see you do your hard work and and hopefully um appreciate that and and bring you on board to do other things. Yeah, yeah. I mean a lot of people would probably say it's luck, but they weren't with you catching that bus. Yeah, from Canberra That's it. to Sydney, <laughs> That's they it. were with yeah. you on that bus ride. Yeah, you know, they try and wake me up at yeah, like five no, in the morning. Exactly, nah. running for that bus <laughs> back a bit. Um, yeah. So that being said, one thing I like about Triple J now is that um, I like the whole bars of steel thing. Yeah. Um, I like how you actually get an Australian artist on. I feel like that's something that was missing for a long period mm. of time. Like sort of radio that's just not just radio. Like ha ha ha. Yeah. Some segment music. Yeah. You know, like you guys actually try to incorporate other other you know parts of it. Um. And it's just good to see other... You actually get to see Australian people with bars. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. I know it probably sounds crazy, but 
it's just, you know, you see a lot of international radio mm. stations and they really try to encourage that. They really try to encourage local acts yeah. to, you know, to come onto the radio station. And then because of that, you're just hearing local music all the time. Yeah. You know, and I, and I feel like that's happening now. Where I probably, I've lived in Sydney since I was probably nine. And probably I've never seen as many people just driving listening to Australian music. Yeah, I know. It's, pretty, it's, I, it's I, been wild. You know, especially down, because I'm, I'm from, I grew up in Fairfield, but I'm from out uh, Blacktown. Yeah. And, you know, one time I was driving, I was driving to work. I looked to the right, and, you know, someone's play, playing Chill in it. Yeah. I looked to the left, someone's playing 1-4, you know, and, and the person in front of me is, um, um, who was playing some um, Yibi. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, what the yeah. hell? Like, it was one of the moments, I was chilling, <coughs> I was thinking about it, I was just like, this is a massive thing. Like now it's on radio. People actually, you know, vibe into this type of music. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and it doesn't even have to be on radio either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's just there's a lot of things that go into that. Is you know, there's a lot of great musicians are being exposed more. Yeah. But also the talent is a lot. The quality is a lot better. Yeah. You know, when I was coming up, there was only a handful people that were making quality music. There was a lot of musicians, but a lot were not good. Yeah, yeah. But now... Keep it on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, as with anything, any kind of industry. And so now it, you have these young artists growing up, not only on Australian stuff, but UK stuff, European stuff, yeah. Asian stuff, US stuff. And we're starting to create our own versions of that. Yeah. You know, like... Um, and I feel we relate to that more because of the content... And again, you know, like a lot of Pacific Island kids look up to people like Hooligan Hess and One Four and and Pete and Enzo because it they look like them, yeah, and sound like them. It's relatable. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, for me personally, um, because I'm the youngest of four, so all my older siblings were sort of into that R and B generation. Yeah. So I would grow up listening to Joe, CD, for example. Yeah. Oh, like, Joe! Yeah, That's my I man. was like, I was like seven. <laughs> Listening to Joe, like, you know, because that's what my series were listening to. Yeah, but, yeah. like, a lot of people always say, like, and then a lot of my older friends, like, my, my older heads always say, you know, Tupac and Biggie was a great generation. And, I, like, I, I love that generation. You know, there's so many generations. But I just feel like right now, music is just so diverse, man. Like, yeah. just so many different cultures, so many different places of making music. Like, yeah. so many people are more, a lot more empowered to make music. Yeah. So I feel like, for me personally, I feel like this generation... It's probably it's probably my favorite generation of music just because of di the diversity. Yeah, you know, and definitely. people who think that you know, or we understand like you can't you can't compare musicians from generations because I guess in anything, even if it's sport, yeah, people it's are like, supposed to get better. Yeah, you're exactly. supposed to get better. It's like people comparing Jordan and LeBron. You know, you can have certain arguments, <clears> but it's like, well, that would, it was just a totally different era. Yeah, exactly. You know? um, yeah, but yeah, so. Again, so you know, it went from uh, went from being an artist to to uh, being on the radio, and then now you, you know you've stepped into you you probably have you, you have you have tens of jobs, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But now you um you know you're managing one four. So I want to talk about like you know how that process happened and you know how you linked up with those boys and, and the process and how it's been. Yeah, so I've actually that someone else has stepped into that role. Okay, um, but I'm still involved with the guys. Yeah, but yeah, that happened because again Ricky he put me on to 1-4 yep. he said oh have you seen these guys from out west and, and I was like no nah. and traditionally a Pacific Islander coming from out west would he, that would try and sound American yeah, and, and influenced by more west coast kind of hip hop but then when I heard 1-4 and they were rapping like like, uh, like a, their natural accent and, and the content and the type of beats I was like <coughs> What is what are these kids from? Obviously, yeah. they they must listen to UK music because yeah. of the way they were delivering their their rhymes and how they were sounding. Not sounding like they're from the UK, but taking the the fact that you can sound yourself, yeah, and yeah. make it sound good, yeah. Um, and so I would kind of watch them do their thing, and and it wasn't until they released the song, in, I think it was October twenty eighteen, "What You Know," and I saw it, and I was like, okay, these. There's that something. There's something really special here, so I reached out and said, "Oh, you know, I, I see you guys doing your thing again. Like I was saying, like I, I really like what you're doing. If you need some feedback, if if you really want to give us a crack, you know, let's meet and talk and see where your head's at." Yeah. And so we had a meeting out in Maori County, 
at the steakhouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, that was in November. Yeah. And since November, we've just been rocking. That's and, dope, man. You know, I, I said, what's the biggest, what are the biggest obstacles that are preventing you from doing this full time or really giving this a go? And, you know, that had a lot of legal issues as well. But one of the main factors was um, studio. Studio time, yeah. Yeah. It's expensive, man. It's expensive. And I'm not sure if there's too many... Um, spots out that way unless you have your own personal yeah yeah so a lot of the artists i know they either they either rent out a house between yeah. six to seven nights they rent out pay 150 a week or whatever yeah and then you'll just transfer them to a studio yeah 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 which is a good <coughs> good idea and, and in the case of one four they were using street uni damn street uni yeah because they get, got one in mount jordan one in liverpool, liverpool. yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to street uni doing great things and so yeah. they had they had a studio but the thing with, with that studio was it was very it was a basic setup. Yeah. Good enough to do s- some stuff. Yeah. But it was, it was a very basic setup and they only had our blocks to do stuff. Yeah. So because it would always be booked out, so you'd have to book out hour and, and and they would laugh because they say they would book this hour and go in there and then start watching YouTube and mucking around. It wasn't until like the last twenty minutes. 20 minutes oh yeah. shit, we better start doing yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so. I was like, okay, cool. If I if if I can give you studio space to do some things, like, would you consider, you know, coming in, do some music? I'll be there, mentor. And they're like, yeah, just name the place, time, we'll be there. And so, yeah, we went to Sony Studios. And January, you know, worked with Paper Toy and I Am Solo. Got some beats from... Uh, Sonda and Gotcha from the UK. Yeah. And in January, released um, Shanks and Shivs. And from then on, it was just like. It was a wrap. Even Shanks and Shivs was like big because it, it was like, oh, okay, people. Are, and it wasn't too far after what you know. Mm-hmm. Whereas previously, the gaps between the songs would be quite long. And there was no consistency there. So when that dropped, people were, it was starting to buzz like, oh wow, you know, there's people catching on. And mm-hmm. then it wasn't until the message dropped, and even then it was like big, but it wasn't. It was it wasn't until the UK caught on, and then just, it was well, from yeah. then on. I noticed that. I noticed that you know, there's been a lot of love internationally, which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's only good for Australian artists. 100%. I mean, having eyes having eyes in Australia. Yeah, they really. I mean, th- th- other people have. M- made inroads like hilltop hoods uh sampa she's been that killing she, it. she she by far because uh, i always say like i know we're probably getting off topic but for me sampa is like because i'm from zimbabwe so where yeah. we're from is the right neighboring yeah so a lot of the artists a lot of people listen to are like western africans or yeah. eastern africans yeah. or they're just straight down from, from the south south africa yeah. but she is literally telling the story of like the african diaspora to the t yeah. Like with no like, literally, her her music is like African sport. Yeah, like she does it perfectly, and it's dope. That's, That's the thing. Dope music, it's just you dope know? music. Yeah, you can have stop. you can have the aesthetic, but that ma- coupled with talent, charisma, and and just dope music, uh, you know. So she, yeah, she's doing great, you know, great things. Remy doing his thing, listen there. So there's, so there was a few people. Doing things here and there, but yeah. with one four, I felt <clears throat> it was like Ricky said. You know, he he doesn't feel there's been an actual song like the message that created that kind of impact. Like there's certain artists with certain songs, like a bunch of songs, yeah, yeah, and then working it. But as as far as one one song, song that yeah, yeah, that kind of like really cracked it, it, it the message and it, yeah, I've, I've never been, I've never seen anything like that. And I've obviously never been a part of it. So to yeah. see it and actually be involved with it, it was such a spin out. And to see it grow from the studio to being celebrated locally and then the UK catching on and the US catching on, it's, it was phenomenal. And then seeing people like Unknown T and Dave posting about it and you're like, what the hell is going on here? You know, just never thought about it. And I, think yeah. it's, I think also it's because... Australia is so far away from the Lord. I feel like people don't realize that 
a lot of the same experiences that you see yeah. in America and the UK. It's literally the exact same. But people just see us as like a big beach. Yeah. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? You know, a lot of people, you know, we'll go to New York and people are like, where are you from? Like, Australia. And they're like, what, what do you mean? Like, Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Then, you know, they think, and, and I th- a lot of people in the UK too, uh, their, their perception of what an Australian <coughs> looks like is either white or, oh, abri- yeah. or yep. Aboriginal. Yep. They don't know there's like other cultures here. And, and that was the beauty of one for challenging the perceptions of what an Australian looks like for people. Like you look at all those UK reactions and they're trying to figure out who, who, where these what you, kids are from. from. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, they kind of look, they look a bit Asian, but then they kind of look, um, you know, they're kind of brown, but they've they got big size. And, you know, where it's, are they it's from? very foreign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, that, and Dan and, and Kaz was, you know, like, oh, yeah. One of my favorite reaction guys was like, oh, yeah. it's, they're like The Rock. You know, <laughs> they're, they're like The, the Rock, Rock yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, no, it is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just to see not only musically breaking barriers, but culturally yeah, as yeah. well. And so you, now you see all those reaction videos. They're, they're looking at more Pacific Islands, but Australians in general, because yeah. they're just like, wow, this is what's happening over there. Mm. Even when I went to London last year, I went into the Sony offices and, a lot of people were genuinely interested about what was happening here. Really? Yeah, like, oh, what's, what's going on down there? Like, because, you know, everyone's had their time, like Canada, obviously, Toronto, and They've had the US time. always, UK, yeah. um, like Africa, and parts of Europe. And, and I think people were just like, well, what, what's going on down there? Yeah. We'd show them like Manu Crooks, yeah. Sampa, Remy. Like, even, we showed them Leroy, and, and people were already onto him, like, oh, yeah, now we watched this in our A&R meeting. And I was like, so it's people, were, yeah, were already looking. And I think it's just a matter of, a matter of time now because yeah. one of the things now that's dope as well is that now you're seeing a lot of other people starting to make music, a lot of other kids from different areas. Because yeah. like I said, I grew up here. Yeah. So like I've seen like, and I was on music heavily. You know, I listened to a lot of music growing up, even in high school. You know, I always listened to dope music. <laughs> I'm shouting out myself, but um, <laughs> you know, I got pretty good taste. Yeah, I got pretty good taste. <laughs> man. Um, but... One thing I noticed is that Australian just didn't have it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just yeah. didn't have the quality. It just, yeah. You know what it is. But, and, you know, and didn't also didn't have the style or the fun. That's right. Yeah, it just, yeah, know? it didn't have that. And I think, you know, going back to what you were saying about coolism, this, that's, our thing was <coughs> style and funk and, and bounce. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other stuff, other hip hop was just about just being hard, yeah. which is, I like too, but we came from a different angle. And, yeah. And yeah, for so many years, Australia didn't have that. You'd have the occasional artists like a Renee Gaya, like going back, um, Daniel Merriweather, you know, people that would come out like with this voice and you're like, wow, he's from Australia. But now it, 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 there's so many like Kaites and, you know, Milan and a lot of artists. We that just are keep com- going. Yeah. yeah. Now we can just, yeah, exactly. just keep going. And now, yeah. and now we can listen to a whole playlist of just Australian artists. And I love that, man. Mm. I, I think it's a I think it's a special time, man. Yeah, I feel like people aren't enjoying this this time. Yeah, more than well, you know, I think, be, man. yeah, you we're just, yeah, you, I think in twenty years time, people will look back and wow, this, that that was Dope time. a moment, especially with one four like we've never seen. Even when chilling it at the time when he came out, it was like before he dropped the album, I knew I was like, man, I think we're gonna see something unprecedented happen here. Like, yeah, just a, essentially an underground artist that were just doing freestyles. Then said, "Oh, I'm about to release my album. I knew it was going to be big. Yeah, and it was. And then with one four again, unprecedented, and just popped off. And I think, you know, will we see something like that again? Who knows? But it is just something that very special that not only for hip hop or Pacific Island community, but just the, the the music industry in general. Yeah, I'm sure like the the old heads in the music industry now are going." Who the fuck are these one four kids? Yeah, exactly. Like, like what are what? they doing? Yeah, yeah. Mount Druid? What <laughs> the hell? And they got three million views. What is happening? You know, because for so long, major labels had a grasp on a lot of things. Yeah, you know? yeah. But now they've opened up the doors. Like, big shout out to my sister, Petrina. You know, she's doing great work and she got me in there. And we're really trying to shift the culture. Mm. People from the culture caring about the culture and bringing in like opening the doors and letting everyone run through mm. but you know also what it was <clears throat> i remember in high school sometimes people would be like you'd be, you'd be playing music out 
and then you know you would hear an Australian artist, and f- for some reason people would feel like it, would be, it, it was a diss <laughs> yeah. to listen to, to an Australian artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, yeah, like, people, people are like, oh, yeah, cringy. Th- yeah. And now I think people are, they're, they're tra- I think people are transitioning from that sort of mentality yeah, and culture. 100%. And yeah. now they're like, oh shit, all right, let me put this. Yeah, I can rub with this. Yeah, let me put this on my playlist. Louder, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's true. And, and it, because it's cool. Yeah. I mean, a lot of hip hop <clears> wasn't cool. Yeah. And, and a lot of kids from our background couldn't relate to it. Yeah. Whereas a lot of white kids could, like with the Hilltop Hoods, they, they had not only great music, but they were white kids from the suburbs. And other white so kids from the suburbs were like, yeah. oh shit, this is like us. Like Pacific Island kids now are looking at Hefts and one four like, that's us. Yeah, you know? sure. So representation. For a long while, it was very white hip hop in this mm. country. But the last kind of five years with Rami and Wise and, and Blessed and so many other artists, the Africs and... Um, really kind of changing that perception and shifting the culture and the next generation is coming up and taking taking it on and taking it elsewhere mm-hmm. man it's, it's a beautiful thing to witness and i'm very i feel very fortunate to come from the early 90s and seeing a lot of things come and go but in particular this transition that we're seeing yeah and it's just gonna, in five years time man you know ooh, ooh, it's gonna be even stronger but um also you know we know that like you know one four has had a lot of issues with for example, touring, yeah, um, and, and you know, performing at shows. So, how does that situation go down? Is it is it that the police don't want to get them um, in the venues, or is the venues issue, or, or, or uh, what, what's it's the, the police? <coughs> it's police. The police. I mean, you know, <coughs> look, the, the type of music one for make very straight. Yep, very, it's violent, but that's their life at this time. Yeah, at this point in time, so they're talking about some real, real issues and real things. Put us in music, and it's energetic. It's hype. You see it at a club, people just, you know, I've never seen the energy levels rise so yeah, much. So quickly. Zero to 100. As soon as that first music comes on, Sally comes in with the, the phone call from jail, people just go they know, off they, know the vibe. they know the vibe. They know the vibe. Yeah. So, <coughs> you know, granted, there's, there's certain um, attention because of that, right? Yeah. And, and the boys themselves have, have history with the law. Yeah. Um, so they're trying to, obviously transition from past life into become musicians but the police police aren't having that you know yeah. they, i feel that they, they they don't want to see young pacific island men do well they just want to keep them in the street yeah. and do what they do so they can control them there yeah. and so when they get announced for these shows the police put a lot of pressure on the venues like the venues it's i can understand the venues don't want to have problems with police. Yeah, they no just, one yeah. wants the problem. Yeah, with police. exactly. No yeah. one is. Yeah. No one can fuck with the police. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when they get announced for shows, the police ring up. Oh yeah, one four. They're gang affiliated. This and that. Uh, if you, if this show proceeds, you're gonna lose your license, so or they, yeah. or ah. you're gonna have to get extra security, <coughs> dogs, metal detectors. That's gonna cost X amount of dollars. And that's that's what happened with Dave, you know. Like they did that, and full credit to Handsome Touring and, and Dave's management. He said, "You know what? We're going to foot that bill because we want one four on." Yeah, yeah. And so we had we drew up some guidelines that the boys had to abide by, and the boys were happy. I said, "Okay, sweet, it's all sorted." Well, yeah. A few weeks later, cops ring again. Oh yeah, we have intel that um, a group of guys are coming to do this and that. So you're going to have to have the riot police, this, and this is going to cost you X amount. And, and you know, when, when something's like $15,000, of course, the venue's going to be like, it's not worth you it. know what? Yeah. We can't do that. And understandable. Understandably so. Because the police don't have the power to, to take one for off the bill, but they have the power to kind of manipulate things and, and pressure venues. You know, and, and if a venue gets threatened with losing their license, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that that's where we're at with one four, and it's so unfortunate because this is their hometown, yeah, and people want to see them. Kind of form, and that's what it, like I always say, like <clears throat> it's going to be very hard for artists to perform, especially in Sydney, because the laws here uh, yeah. they still. I, I feel like the the New South Wales government still doesn't see music yeah. as an export. No, it's they, 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 yeah, they, they, they've they've sucked the the, the art and the and the the life and the love and, and creativity out of the city. Yeah. Because, you know, 
Sydney in general is bad anyway. And yeah. then when you have someone like one four in the mix, then it's like takes off. Yeah. So yeah, it's very unfortunate that a lot of you know this generation and and the next generation are going to see that kind of life that that you may see in, in somewhere like Melbourne. Yeah. You know. But yeah, but but that, even like you know you're not the first person to say the exact same thing because. It's also not just about the lockout laws. It's also about you know the pressure that the government puts on these venues. Yeah. And as a venue owner, you're you know that's a business. You yeah. know, you, you have a business really, and it's an investment. So you know there's only so much you can take exactly. before like you know, and then the day it's your investment. You're losing money yeah. if if you're if you're choosing to consistently you know go against the police, and they don't want to do that because usually most of them aren't really from the culture. Yeah. They just you know. People have invested into a venue or, or whatever. Yeah. So you know, I think that is the most critical part. I think both lockout laws and that go hand in hand. And yeah, until definitely. the New South Wales government starts to take the Australian music scene, uh, well, New South Wales starts to take the Sydney music yeah. scene as an like a export, a financial export, which it is now. Yeah. Which and it's starting to become. It's not going. You're going to have Sydney artists doing crazy shows in Melbourne. Yeah. Going to Queensland well, like know, they do. Yeah. One four HP time. boys are doing a show in Brisbane. You know, it's like, we want to see that show. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, and it's everything that you said. And, <coughs> you know, there's a slice of, of prejudice in there as well. Yeah. You know, like, someone <coughs> was telling me there's certain songs that they can't play in the city, like Afro songs. Yeah. They yeah. don't want Africans in the city. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've said this a couple of times, but uh, even Ziggy, when Ziggy was on, mm. he was telling me how, you know, sometimes he would go to clubs and they don't want to, they don't want to miss Afro wave. And yeah. he's like, what are you talking about? Or, for example, Ivy, me and my homie went there. And, you know, at that time, they weren't allowing black people in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just like, you see that presence. Yeah. But I also, on that side, you know, that, that's obviously the negative side. But I also see that, that change in culture. Yeah. It's going to take a good minute. Yeah. But the change in culture is slowly coming. You got to keep knocking yeah. these doors down. A hundred percent. You know, and, and I'm just playing my position. You know, someone yeah. will come ahead and take what I, what we've achieved and take it even further. Yeah. You know, that. I, I just have a problem where there's an industry that's built off of our music like yeah, not exactly. having us involved. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's, yeah, that's just shit. Mm. But also, you know, that being said, you know, you're mentoring, you know, one four and you're really helping them. You know, you're just reaching out, you know, yeah. you're offering your service. You know, I like that because, you know, you can tell that's coming from a place of, you know, just being humble, just being a servant of the game. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And yeah. I think a lot of people, they, they don't want to humble themselves and just, you know, if you if you love a craft, you know you, you're there for that craft. Yeah. You know, you're if you're truly passionate about it, and you, a, a lot of it came because uh, I'm genuinely passionate about the culture, and I want to see the culture grow and certain artists do well. You know, a lot of my peers they they don't care. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. these kids are making this and that. It's like, well, that music's not for you anyway, man. Yeah. They're like yeah. twenty years older than the demographic. So, but my thing was, if you can't complain about that if you're not contributing to it. Exactly. If you're you know, trying like, to get in the club, why are you? Why yeah, you? exactly. Why are you worried <coughs> about what these kids are doing when it's not for you and you're not there trying to help them? Yeah. So that was my thing too. It's like, if I want it to prosper or see, see the culture reach its full potential, I need to give back. Yeah. You know what I mean? I need to help and, and like, at least present opportunities and share knowledge and you know, there's, there's other people too that they want you to struggle like they struggled. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I hate that. It's like, I man, I had to do to this and that to get yeah. here so you're going to have to do that. Man, fuck that. Yeah. You know, like, it, you obviously don't love it enough. Yeah. yeah. Or you're just greedy. You're bitter. Greedy you're just bitter. person. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, just because you didn't get somewhere you thought you wanted, you don't want someone else to get that. Mm. But I'm like, man, here, this is the knowledge, man. You go. Run. Take it. And that's dope, man. Um, you know, and, and is that something that you you enjoy doing, like mentoring? Because I know you mentor, uh, you know, and you reach out to a lot of artists. You know, yeah. a lot of artists. You, you, the first person they talk about is you and me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I say, <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I mean? For a lot of artists, you yeah. know. And if it's just one or two artists, and you can be like, all right, mate. But yeah. it's like every artist for some reason they know you, or they know Rick, and then they mm. they know what you guys have done to help them, or you've talked to them, mm. or you put them on uh, some sort of platform to help them, you know, to get there. Mm. You know, so where does that passion come from? Again, I think I think it's it goes back to me not having that. Yeah. Like my OGs were like do the did graffiti and street guys. You know, if I wanted to go down that lane, then awesome. Yeah. But my thing was music. Yeah. And so I 
you know, I mentioned before about trying to, f we've had to figure all these things out ourselves. Yeah. And we didn't want people to have to do that. Yeah. You know, opposite to other people like, oh, if I have to struggle, you have to struggle. No, it's like, I struggled, so you didn't have to struggle. Exactly. So it, it, it just comes down to knowing what, where these young musicians are at and the obstacles that they may face. Because, you know, the industry can be overwhelming, very dishonest and disheartening. It's cutthroat. Yeah, you know, and, and it is a lot of hard work. But that, a lot of that hard work can be alleviated by people like Ricky and myself and Petrina and, and yourself. You know, like just knowledge being passed around, being passed down. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, again, goes back to me not having someone to ask those questions. Yeah. Like I, I, you know, I wanted to reach out to people because, like you said before, sometimes people think um, I'm uncontactable. Yeah, you know, like oh no, he's out there, he can't, you know. But I, I don't want that. I want it to be the opposite. Like that's why I reach out first. Yeah, and a lot of people do say like, oh shit, wow, you know, thanks. I appreciate. It. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because they see you on the radio, man. They see you walking around with these big artists, and I feel like you know they they think that there's that distance, but. I think also a lot of people, they're, they're scared of taking that risk. They're scared yeah. of just shooting that shot because they, they feel... As I get if, that, man. Sorry? I, I definitely understand that. Because I was like that too. I was very <coughs> shy and, you know, and I think there's certain things as a Pacific Islander too, the way you're, you're raised about humbling yourself, not rocking the boat, be grateful for what you have, which, uh, which is great, but a lot of that is very disabling. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. You know what I mean? I think I think I think a lot of immigrants have that mentality yeah. of um, just be grateful for what you have. Yeah, which you know is I mean? awesome because as our parents coming from certain areas, yeah, of course, yeah. you know they got jobs that they would never have before and have a house. Yeah, and they're able to provide for the family, and of course you're gonna be grateful. You have to be grateful anyway. But there's more to that, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I want to say is like you know you don't have to play footy. You don't have to be a musician. You don't have to work, be security. You know, you can have other creative jobs. You can have law, like any, anything you mm -hmm. want to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? Man, I read, you know, I noticed because I grew up with a, with a bunch of islanders. I grew up with a bunch of Tongans. And Pacific Islanders have big hearts, man. Yeah. Good people. Yeah. Good people. I grew up with a lot of them. So what sort of, um, what sort of advice do you have to sort of up and coming artists? What sort of mistakes do you see a lot of artists making your own? Man, it's that golden <coughs> rule, man. Like, never goes out of style, never goes out of trend. Like, be yourself. It's very underappreciated. Yeah. You know, uh, you hear it a lot, but I don't think people truly take that on. Yeah. You know, because no one can do you better than you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And because if, you know, obviously you're going to be inspired by and influenced by a lot of artists. But don't be afraid to be yourself, you know. Like, you know, if I want to listen to someone that sounds like Travis Scott, I'll listen to Travis Scott. Yeah, literally. Yeah. You know, that's what a mean? good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's all right to <clears throat> be inspired by Travis Scott, but then mix that up with with you and your surroundings, how you grew up. Yeah. And I think that's the sweet spot where, like One Four, they're heavily inspired by UK drill, by Harlem Spartans, but they mix it up with them growing up in the Great West them being Pacific Island heritage. And that's where that sweet spot is, is a, a, a bit of this mixed with a bit of that and comes together and that's, yeah, magic right there. Yeah. Well, uh, man, I appreciate your time. Bro, I, I you. appreciate you having me on, man. Thank yeah, you. no worries. No, we appreciate you here, man. A lot of people want to hear this information, a lot of excited people. So, yeah, I appreciate your time, man. I appreciate no it. Thank you. No Easy. worries.